welcome. And um, I think we'll I think we'll uh, go ahead and get started. Simon, are you ready with that uh, land acknowledgement? You can do yes. that. I, I am ready with that. I just wasn't ready with my mute button. All right, we the Climate Reality Dallas, <clears throat> excuse me, Dallas Fort Worth chapter acknowledge the ongoing harm caused by colonialism and white supremacy perpetuated in Texas. Indigenous communities have suffered genocide and forced removals from their lands. We recognize that we all are standing on land stolen from indigenous people, particularly those of Kickapoo, Wichita, Tawakani, Jumanos, and Comanche in the DFW areas. We are committed to cultivating mindfulness around the history of native lands and communities through continuous education, participation, and active listening. Good, thank you. Uh, Simon, since you're, since you're talking, maybe you can go over our community ground rules quickly. Absolutely. Our rules for every meeting are as follows. Please make space or take space. Limit your responses for two minutes each so everyone has an opportunity to share. When you speak, please speak from the I perspective instead of generalizing. Practice active listening and seek to understand the, the position of the other person. Assume that everyone here has good intentions. Respect one another's space, time, and interest. Be willing to be uncomfortable. Be open to productive discomfort. Remember that intent does not negate impact. Disagree without discord. Personal attacks and labeling have no place in our chapter. And as always, accept that there are no quick fixes for the issues we discuss. Great, thank you. Uh, I'd just like to take a minute. Um, I see a couple of names that aren't too familiar. Janice, we chatted a little. Would you like to say hello and um, maybe tell us why you're here today? And I see a Jay Sinks. Maybe Jay Sinks can also say hello and uh, say, say why uh, he or she is here today. Janice? Uh, yes, hi, good morning to everyone. Um, my name is Janice Chen. I live in Plano, Texas. Uh, I joined uh, the um, Climate Community Project um, back, I don't know, like five years ago. Um, but I always go to the San Fernando Valley and Los Angeles chapter meetings because that's where my daughter, um, that's where my daughter, she writes the um, uh, the the letter, the monthly letter for everyone. And so I actually joined the Climate uh, Reality Project because of two of my daughters. And then I, made, I became a mentor. Uh, I didn't really like that. I'm not a person who can really talk to people. Um, and I have joined the DFW uh, meetings maybe in two or three occasions in the past. It's just that it's been very difficult for me to get into the meetings like today. And sometimes I just forget, but I'm glad to be here and get to know everybody. Well, Janice, we're happy to have you. We may have Pradeep, our technical guy, uh, reach out to you and try and figure out why you had problems connecting to our meetings. That should be seamless, but we'll, we'll get that fixed. So uh, it's good to have you. Glad you're involved and working for you, through your daughters. Uh, we have a lot of work to do for the future generations. Um, so I think you're right on track. We're, we're happy to have you. Looks like I scared Jay Sinks away with my um, overly assertive, aggressive manner. So, um, ah, Patricio is logging on. But, so we'll have people come and go. Um, I think our next little section 
Um, Beth, would you have something creative for us today? Yes, the creative contemplation for the day is about service. The part of you that serves and serves the earth. How you serve self, other, and earth, and it is good. The other part of the contemplation is how the earth serves us. And it is a dance. It is a never ending, ongoing dance between the earth and us. She's doing the best that she can within the circumstances that we have created for her, which is part of our service. And we do this dance and sometimes we humans forget but she does not. And so today we contemplate the mutual gifts of service. And so our meeting is open. <clears throat> Thank you, Beth. Uh, I see uh, Chip put in a, a comment. Uh, I was listening to Michael Moore about the movie Barbie, which he just thinks is one of the greatest movies um he's seen in many years which surprised me but uh, uh chip chip put in a comment about that thank you chip well i think we're gonna we're gonna jump into our speaker we're very fortunate to have josh minor here today especially the beginning of school um and he's the executive director of facilities and construction and um, Hearst Ulysses Bedford ISD. So uh, there's certainly a lot of work there this month and, and coming up to this month. But uh, thanks to John Quinn, who recruited him, ha had been familiar with him and recruited him to speak. And we were able to work that out for today's meeting. Uh, he's been involved in facility maintenance and construction for, for over 30 years. Uh, this experience has been utilized in commercial and residential industries, covering higher ed, K through 12, and other specific built, built facilities. Josh is a member of Texas Energy Managers Association, TEMA, Texas Association for School Board Officials, ASBO, North Texas Facility Service Association, NTFSA, Association for Learning Environments, A4LE, and also sits on the Texas Association for School Boards, TASB, Energy Board. Josh currently works for HEBISD, as I've mentioned, as the Executive Director of Construction and Facilities, overseeing maintenance and operations, and oversees and manages all aspects of the construction process. So um, thank you so much, Josh, for being here today. Uh, we know you've got a very busy schedule, especially at this time of the year, and with all these uh, these uh, committee commitments. Also, I'm sure you're very busy. So, welcome, and and you have the floor. Excellent. Thank you all, and I appreciate you guys having me and and allowing me to be able to come and uh, share about what we do. Um, one of the things that you may not think that uh, you know we, we don't stand out. We're kind of a hidden gem, I would say, between the Metroplex. Uh, you know, we sit right between two of the biggest districts, uh, Fort Worth and Dallas, but also we've got Arlington to the south. Um, we're not flashy. We don't greenwash. So I and hope you understand what that means. Like, a, we, if we're doing something, we're doing it because that's what's the best way to do it for what for our needs and uh, for the environment and for our students. Um, another little piece too to give you a little bit of background because this is going to come up later in my in my talk. Um, my background, I studied architecture in college when I first started. So that does obviously that leads right into the construction and uh, all of my experience. But the other piece that's usually gives people that kind of uh, crooked look at me is 
my, my degree is actually in applied behavioral analysis. So I studied architecture and behavioral analysis and uh, actually worked with children. Um, I've been, I had to do part of my time at the state school in Denton. Um, I was a camp counselor, worked with special needs and had kids out there that we mainstreamed. Uh, and so that, that plays into a little bit here in just a minute about the reason and uh, some decisions moving into some of the ways we are more efficient. Um, so today I wanna to talk about um, how we utilize current technology uh, to be more sustainable for HEB and for our students. And the thing is, we, I, I always tell our, our staff, we're not gonna be on the bleeding edge. Um, I will study, I research, I'm always watching that because that will eventually become, as it smooths out, it'll become our standard in, uh, in technology that we use. But today what we're doing is we're using technology of today to be able to be as, as sustainable as possible. And one way I explain that to some people too is, you know, when I was younger, um, the, you know, we watched the Jetsons and everybody thought that Rosie was going to be, that was it. That's where we were going to go to. And we we're going to have a robot that would take care of everything. And we we're going to lose our jobs and blah, blah, blah. But really what it came down to is, is that's not the direction. We're more like Fifth Element. If you watch that movie, you understand it wasn't one robot that's doing everything. We have specific special use uh, instruments and uh, and robots providing different services. So we're we're looking at things a little bit different as far as how to be more sustainable than probably what some would. Um, the second thing I want to make sure too is I want to I want to tell you how we engage in um, an actual impact. Uh, what we do is we're going to look at the ROI. We're going to look at how that impacts our environment. Um, we want to make sure that there is actual reduction in use for us and that we see that in the bottom line, and we're going to utilize that data. So if you know anything about HEBISD, we're a, we're a very data-driven district, and we, we follow a, a Baldridge uh, model. Um, we want to be able to have the data explain what we do. So one of the things that I do a lot of times, there's a term, I say we're going to do um, bullets before cannonballs. In other words, we're going to research something, we're going to look into it, and then we're going to pilot that. And it'd be like, if you can imagine two ships uh, warring on the, on the sea, they're taking a rifle and they're gonna get their range. And once they get their range in, then they're just gonna unleash all the guns. And so we follow that method a lot. So anytime I'm using a technology, we will test it on us. And our office is essentially like part of our um, mad scientist laboratory. When we moved into LEDs, we put them in, in our energy management and we tried and, and experienced and tested them and played with them on them before we release them. I will never release it into a classroom until we've tested it on us first. And so we wanna know all the, the ins and outs. And then also be able to bring in that ROI. And then also, like I said, to be able to tell you, am I, am I using electricity wisely? Am I conservative? I'll be able to say that you know, effectively. Um, so let me begin and tell you uh, some of the ways that we're doing that. So first of all, um, HEB is one of the most efficient or most conservative in the state. Um, we, in this past year, have had uh, a couple consultants come in, and you can say that, but it's good to have people come in and test you, and we had a couple consultants come in, and one of them just swore up and down that they could save us money and, and, um, and help us out, and so we said, okay, great, come to the table, let's have a conversation. Then we walked a couple of our facilities, and when we got to the end, they looked at us and were like, um, not that there's not area for improvement, but the business model didn't work for them because we were already so efficient and we had already attacked a lot of the low lying fruit that they were going to, you know, and you kind of know that you, you know, work in this industry, you know what they're going to come after. And we'd already taken care of those. And then another company came in and they were kind of saying the same song and dance. And, and so, yes, we want to see, they have a different perspective. Well, they, they knew immediately we had no low lying fruit, but they had another concept they were going for. But then when we really sit down at the table and said what our future was, we were already moving that direction. So we were already talking about programming systems and doing some of the things that they were talking about. So again, the model didn't work for either one or both of us. So we didn't go into that, but they did say, you know, of, of clients that we've looked at, you're definitely in the top 10 or top five in the state of who is the most efficient and how, and the methods that you're using to, to be able to get there. So um, how do we do that? What are we, what is, how do we get to uh, know what the, you know where we need to be focusing our attention and how to align our goals and what we're using? I would say let's start off with the Pareto principle. So the 80-20 rule. So in school districts, and it doesn't this applies to any school district in the state. We are a service industry essentially, and so our heavy uh, costs in districts are going to be in the 80 percent or more uh, is payroll. So that's that's on that side. 
of any facility, and this typically plays true, sorry about that, this true plays true typically in even your home. 10% of your budget is gonna fall over onto your maintenance. And maintenance then is going to include your utilities. So if you look at our utilities, our, our, our budget, that's basically how it goes. 88% is payroll. The next 10% of that is gonna be maintenance and operations. And of maintenance and operations, we then have electric, electricity is gonna be the largest piece of that as well. So we budget about $3 million a year on electricity. But since I've been here, we have never hit that or exceeded that. And that is with increasing our district's uh, square footage cost, or I'm sorry, square footage, about a million. When I got here, we were about 2.5 and we're setting, we're pushing over 3.5 now. And we have construction coming up that is gonna push us probably more in the range of four to 4.2 million square feet in the next um, five to, to seven years. Um, the other thing that's I'm proud to be able to say is, so if we're focused on that electricity, anytime you bring a building on, you typically see like, here's our budget going along. And all of a sudden, when that building comes online, you see a plateau. It is just like a straight line. And here's the new norm. Ours looks more like a, a lazy uh, hill from out in the panhandle. And that's where I come from. That's my, my background is growing up in the panhandle and, uh, and being able to see. We just said, you stand on a chair and you can see another state. Um, and so that's how I wanted our electricity to be able to run. So we don't want any severe changes in that budget. So if I take that, then I'll look at the next piece. Then if I want to attack my electrical, what are the things that we're going to be looking for? And the two biggest systems in a school district, or probably even you know, this applies in most facilities, um, a typical facility, it's going to be either HVAC and or elect, uh, your lighting. So we started working on that when I first got here about uh, a little over four, 13 years ago. And so we moving from the old HVAC systems and looking what we could move to the future. Again, my background comes from colleges. So there's different types of systems. Many of you are going to think geothermal right off the bat. So that would be, many think that's the most efficient system, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of drawbacks to that. Again, when I say ROI, I'm looking at the total, uh, uh, total cost of operation. So in my situation, I don't have somebody who is a water tech. I don't have people who are trained and understand water pumps. And then we don't have typically a piping system on many of our buildings um, that works well. And the other thing too is coming from higher ed, higher ed works with a chiller type system because anytime you've got a facility that is either going to run 24 seven. So when a college, you're going to have dormitories, library, libraries, uh, rec centers, and your student unions, they run 24 seven, just about, and you're always going to have a chiller running and you want those chillers running at about 75 to hundred percent and keep them moving so that the energy efficiency is there. If you start dropping down, so let's now look at a K-12. When we drop our population off at three o'clock in the afternoon, we go from essentially 100% and we'll drop down to less than 10. And that's it. So between, we'll go from elementary, let's say seven o'clock, high schools run the latest, they're at four o'clock. So if we're running between that, that'd be great. You're running at 100%. But if I had a chiller and as soon as everybody leaves and I only have 10, 15, 20 teachers in a building, that chiller has to spool back and is now essentially like if you were driving a standard vehicle, it's lugging and it's just sitting there and it's spending a lot of energy to try to produce a, a little bit of effect for you. So we shifted, we, we don't have chillers. I actually removed one of the last chillers a number of years ago when I did, the electrical uh, savings on that uh, was, was dramatic. Everybody was trying to figure out what happened. So we took the chiller out and we moved, went to RTUs. RTU stands for rooftop unit. So it's like, imagine at your house, you have a, a, a condenser sitting on the outside. Well, this one is a big, big machine sitting on the roof and dumps straight into your ducts into the building. Um, and so we, we moved to that, but the reason too is, here's that piece where today's technology is actually be helping us. We moved to a, a, a unit that's called, it's the company's name Aon, but Aon, Linux, a lot of these companies started shifting over and so they have compressors that could, they used to be two stage. Instead of just coming on, they go from zero to a hundred, you had this spike and you'd see this big spike in your electrical and then it would come off. Um, and then you're running at a high usage the whole time. Your fan did the same thing. When it came on, it kicked hard and then it just runs 100% out. In our situation, what it'll do is it comes on soft. And if we need 15%, it stays at 15. If it needs 60, it starts ramping up. So it works similar to a chiller to where you have that variability. And the fan works like you would your pumps. You can sit there and run them from zero to 100%. 
So it's not like the old way of doing that. Um, and then if you take what we have is we have a building management system or EMS or a BMS, it sits on top of that. So whereas I'm not like a house, I'm also not like big box. I'm running from a central location. I'm running the entire district. Every one of those units run through a system. So we have controllability at a high level. And then we can give some controllability at the local level to, um, to our occupants, to our teachers, our faculty. And they can have, they have a couple degrees they can move in there, but we're running it in the background. And then the other part too is we, we run that uh, on a, a set schedule. And if anybody wants to occupy our building outside of that schedule, you have to then come in and you request air. So as I'm sitting here, I've already had to hit my override today twice. It may kick off on me here in a minute. And you'll start seeing me glisten just a little bit, but I can go over, hit that, and I have control ability to override that for one to four hours at a time and to be able to keep this going. How do I know this works or why do I know this works? When I first got here, we built a building about 10 years ago over in Viridian. And those of you that know, between Arlington and Euless, uh, is a development that went in kind of down in the Trinity River bottoms. And it is a, it's a uh, at the time, they were wanted to be the first auto bond um, uh, certified development in the United States. What that meant was anybody or anything built inside that development had to meet this standard or had to have a certain amount of uh, level of energy efficiency to it. So when we were doing the covenant, I had to negotiate that covenant because there was a lot of things that we would do that they were that they didn't want or they didn't think would work or things that they wanted us to do and it didn't work for us as well. So one of those, they immediately said, are you going to use geothermal? We said no. And of course, it sucked the wind out of the room, but we had to sit down and explain. We have our, G, uh, our engineers and the engineers explain that basically where, I, where we sit here, we've got the Trinity River just to the uh, south of us. Um, we sit on an ancient riverbed. And so when you go down and you get down into the soils where you need to be to make that work, a lot of that soil is cemented sands or sandstone, sand, um, but a lot of composite that doesn't work well for geothermal. You can't take the heat down, displace it and pull back out at the rate and get the delta that you're supposed to have. So, but we said, but listen, it's, we, we have more. <laughs> so we said, Let, let's look at, let's show you what we do and how we control things and see if that will still meet your requirement. In the end, it did. And so they were very pleased that we're able to still come in there. Um, another part too was plantings and trees. Of course, high-end development, they want to look a certain way, but at the same time, I had to get them to back off. So one comparison that is, we can drop down part of the heat island effect if we could bring in trees. But one thing, I, and I've even talked to one of our local city councils, uh, council members recently, and the city made the same mistake. That you put in trees and a new development wants a lot of trees, and they, you got this um, a requirement that we have to meet with landscaping. So in doing so, when I started looking at their uh, specifications on trees, <clears throat> the type of trees, most of them worked. A few would not in the area. Um, but then the other problem was they're planting them too close together. They plant them close together because in a new development, they want those to look like it's an established area because they just mowed everything else down. Or we may be putting a development, in their case, in a place that was already uh, desolate anyways. So in doing that, I said, listen, I, I hear what you're saying. I know what we're doing, but we need to not think about today or five years from now. We need to be thinking about today and 25, 30 years out. And that's really where we need to be because when these trees hit full uh, maturity, <clears throat> the canopies are at 45 foot diameters. And just, uh, man, I'm, I'm not a mathematician, but maybe you guys can help me out here. The, the spacing was 25 foot on center to the trunks. The tree canopies diameter is 45. So if I have two trees sitting beside each other, both with a diameter of 45, they can't be sitting 25 feet apart from each other because as they mature, they'll grow into one another. And that's what we're, I'm seeing a lot of now is I'm taking trees out. I look like I'm, I hate the environment, but I've got to take these trees out to make room for healthy trees and to continue to have a healthy uh, uh, forestry. So in doing that, we did, they, they understood, they, they agreed. And so we made that uh, adjustment. Um, a lot of the plantings that they had too were not native to that area, and I didn't want to bring something in that then could cause another issue. John and I were talking yesterday, and I recently found out that part of what happened in Hawaii recently was they brought in some grass because, you know, they didn't have that kind of grass on a volcanic island that they, that they wanted, so they imported. 
Then the thing is a, um, it's an invasive grass. So it takes over and as it spread, then it became dry. And when it became dry, now we've just coated the island in something that is extremely flammable and then can cause a greater issue, which now we're seeing play out in the news. Um, so same thing, I, want, I did not wanna bring something in that I have to then have to water you know, extreme amounts. We wanted to go net zero and that's what we're working towards on our landscape now. So we had a lot of the plants that were uh, requiring a great deal of water and pull that out. <clears throat> we also, the requirement was they wanted to run the irrigation system and it's our facility and we're paying the bill. So it's kind of like if you said your friend said, hey, can I borrow the car, but you're gonna pay the gas and you're gonna pay the inspection and the oil and the tires, but they get to drive it the way they want. Well, we didn't, we didn't agree. We said, we, we don't wanna do it that way, but that's in the end, that's what we had to. Well, it took about a year and then they understood what we were talking about because they overwatered the landscape and killed off about seven trees. And in doing so, we said, listen, it was our requirement. We were supposed to change those trees out. But when we explained what was going on, they turned the irrigation back over to us and they replaced the trees <clears throat> because they knew that we, at that point, we knew what we're doing. You need to listen to us because this is how the best way is to run it. So that became a good model. We, that school has ran as low as 14 cents a square foot on electricity and no more than 24 cents a square foot on electricity on its worst day. Um, our construction methods are another thing that helps, has helped us out. That was one of our first schools. There's a construction method called ICF. It's insulated concrete form. If you can imagine insulation on both sides and then you put concrete and you monolithically pour it in between. So the old adobe homes, you had a big solid piece of, uh, of masonry, essentially mud and packed in. And I've seen that, I've been in Albuquerque and I've been in some of those and in Texas Tech, there's a couple houses that were experimental. You're, you're sitting in a hot area and it, it's actually got this natural chimney effect in cooling itself. You take on heat in the day, you release that at night. So in the winter time, it works out very well as, as well. So <clears throat> on this building, We've got very thick walls. We have very tight windows, double pane insulated glass. We're using insulation built up on our roofs. We have to have no less than 24 at the first layer. And then we're then actually going more because we're doing flat. It looks like a flat roof, but it's flat taper. So we're at some places we have up to over 24 to 28 inches of insulation built on the roof with gravel on top of that to provide a little bit more barrier. So that kind of gives you a couple ideas. So we're, this is not, you know, off the chart new technology. This is taking technologies and utilizing them to work together to be able to provide the most efficient building we can. Now, the next thing, let's go ahead and switch on over to lighting. So electricity, um, I'm sorry, lighting. We, we all have fluorescence and thought going from incandescent to fluorescent was great. And there's the similarities between fluorescence and, and, and the LED are this. We can have 25 to 2,500 to about 5,000 K uh, Kelvins, so you're going to get a soft yellow, you're going to get kind of a bluish white, and you get this really bright white, so you can get somewhere in there. Um, but with fluorescence, you're going to have, you got to buy it that way, and it stays static. LEDs can actually be color tuned, so I can go, I can do the range in the same day if I have color tuning on, the, on that device, okay? They both dim, but fluorescence, you know, they, they don't like to dim as much, and when you also turn them on, you're on 100%, and then the, the if you look at a life cycle on a, a light, a fluorescent, it literally goes out and immediately starts dying on the fluorescent. On LEDs, when we started that, and I told you, we tested them here, we were playing around with them on, on us, experimenting first, and then we turned them over to the school. Well, we don't run ours at 100%, so we're actually already, so if we already have a savings between LED versus uh, fluorescent, I believe that comes in around 25, 27%, we then took them and started 100, and every day they just kept backing off the percentage and dimming them down until finally everybody in the office had to agree and say, okay, right there, stop. It's, now it's a little too dark. I have to provide 35 candles to a desk in a classroom. That is a requirement. So we measured it. We were above the, the 35 candles um, in the class, but in the office, they were like, okay, we just got to a level where it feels like the lights have dimmed down. Um, not really crazy about that. Can we bring it back? So we went down to about 65, 63% and we brought them up. So our 100, 100% in HEB is 65 to 68%. So when I turn my lights on and they come on full, that's only 68% at max. And then inside that I can then run a range. And so I provided programming and switches so that when we bring on our new schools, teachers have the capability of dimming the entire class. 
The other thing that's nice about LEDs versus fluorescence is I can program to do whatever, and then I can switch it tomorrow, and I can do all that remotely from here, from our site, on any school that's in our system. And so we have um, a teaching mode. You hit that, it ramps to the board. So you're still providing light, but we've dimmed it down. And again, it's about the best environment for our students to be able to learn in. And so that's providing that. The second piece to this nice about LEDs versus fluorescence is fluorescence. I remember my, my degree is in applied behavior analysis and working with kids with SPED. Uh, if you have autism, a lot of times they will overstimulate both on light and on sound. And guess what? That's what you have with uh, fluorescence on both sides. Whereas if I switch over to LED, I lose both the sound and I'll lose the strobing. And then I also now have more controllability. And as I have a class of SPED students, and also this works on everybody. This works on a classroom um, of, of typical students, of typical staff, of typical faculty. We were talking about, um, okay, everybody, root cause analysis, what's our greatest issue in, in the school? Uh, I guess it was like seven, eight years ago. And they, it came down, it was behavior. That's what our teachers were challenged with the most, trying to provide um, the entire class with the best education. Okay, so what's causing that? And so, you know what, what was nice is maintenance and operations, I was able to lift my hand and say, listen, um, I don't have the silver bullet, but I have something, I have a solution that can help you. And I was able to come to the table and actually say, if we start converting to LEDs, I can provide you a method that actually on the wall, when you dim the lights, you can actually bring down the behaviors. Because as the lights start to dim, it becomes a little more cozy. It's almost like the ceiling kind of closes down and those behaviors tend to start dropping off. Everybody looked at me, they thought I was crazy, but I looked over to the executive director of uh, special education and she shook her head wholeheartedly because we'd already did this in one of her places. And she's like, Josh is right we agree, I think this would be beneficial. So that's why we went ahead and we started rolling out um, across our district. All of our new projects, we don't, normally you have a conversation at the beginning uh, in construction. It's gonna be your specifications, it's gonna be your building methods you'd prefer. And the next one is almost always, how do we meet the elect, uh, energy code? So people are just trying to get to the code. In our conversations, we don't generally have that. It's usually, we are already exceeding the code so far that they don't even, okay, yeah, we know what your systems are and we don't even have that conversation really much anymore. So, and so on electricity, that's what we do. We have, I was able to show John the, the way our uh, lights operate. I have my office set up almost like a demo because when I'm talking to people, I want them to see what 100% actually looks like. You need sunglasses, you know? I mean, you, you everybody starts squinting when I turn my lights on 100%. Um, and we can show how we dim down. Mine usually set what they're at right now is what we call migraine function. I get migraines and that's another benefit that I can provide to all of our staff is with the LEDs, that strobing can cause that um, effect on migraines. So again, I'm trying to provide the best environment for the most sustainable method. And, and that's how we're getting there with that. And then another thing too would be um, our, our water usage. Um, on the outside is probably where I'm gonna have, um, that's where I'm gonna waste or have the most, um, usage I have to provide again my environment includes my sports fields so I have to provide the safest and best in, um, environment for my athletes to be able to perform now we have moved a lot of our um, large fields over to synthetic but we still do have some grass and some natural but on that you have to do what's called a gmax test and gmax rating a we want to have nice green grass we want no patches so we do have to water that right now during this time of heat you can imagine there's times I have to break off our watering cycles and we have to water two, three times a day, but in shorter increments just to get the water to stay on the ground so the grass can take it in and then be able, if I put too much, it'll just flash off with the heat and actually evaporate. So I have a system that actually helps us with that. We have what are called smart clocks. Um, again, remember I told you bullets before cannonballs. So when we tested this, we put it on one school and we, we watched it. It actually ties into NOAA. It ties into our weather, um, weather station here at my office. And it watches and it reads the internet and watches NOAA's forecast. If our area gets too hot, if our area has too much wind, um, if we've had too much rain in the past X number of days, it knows how much it's watered. It does a calculation and it figures out. The only thing that I could go further, we just haven't done this piece, is I could put probes into our fields and it would take a moisture reading off of the soil, then it would calculate that as well. That's the only piece I don't have. But what it does is it sits there and makes a calculation, says, 
If I water for this amount of time in this heat, we'll have this much uh, evaporation. If I water this much in this amount of wind, I'm gonna have this much blow off. And so the clock actually will make adjustments on its own to be able to provide the amount of water that we need to be able to have the safe fields to grow good grass and also to try to minimize any waste as much as possible. So when we did that, we had a field and our zones ran 45 minutes and we'd already pulled those back years ago to try to save basically a 25% savings on that and still be able to provide what we needed. But now we go to a clock and we look at it <clears throat> and we're expecting to see 45 minutes. And it said the runtime on one zone was 21 minutes. The next day was 37, next day was 15, one day it was uh, 55. And so what it was doing is making that adjustment to be able to provide the same amount. And that was a one field too, that we have not had as many issues with loss of grass or uh, any type of runoff, that type of thing. So we see that that works. So then guess what? We unleashed the cannons and we went ahead and bought clocks like that for all of our other um, and replaced all of our other irrigation clocks. And it's been helpful and we've been able to see that. Now we do work off of both city water and we do have two water wells at our high schools because high schools, we're looking at 55 and uh, 54 and 55 acres. And of that, the number of turf fields that we've had that were synthetic. Um, and then one of our campuses has a great deal of trees. So we have to make sure that we get enough water to those that we're not shocking them during this type of heat as well. So we actually use both um, on those. We'll be use, use mostly the well water. If they ever go down, I do have backup. I can pull from the irrigation from the city if I have to, um, but we're, we're trying not to do that in, in that type of, uh, this time of year. So those are the things that we are doing. Now, there are some things that we are not doing. It's not that we're not, I don't believe in it. It's not that I'm not engaging or researching and trying to find the right, um, the right product is that that's actually what I'm doing. So solar would be one of those things. In the long term, what I foresee is school districts could become uh, solar or, uh, solar farms and do it very in a, in a very smart manner. We have lots of parking lots. To provide a benefit, my method that I'm looking at doing in the future is if we can ever get a solar panel that is as efficient as, as it can be and the technology starts to slow down, then we can jump on board. And what I'm doing when I build facilities, where I'm at right now, we have covers over all of our buses. And I've got a, some other uh, on from some of our white fleet. So when we did that, we ran extra conduit off of those and ran it back to a central location. And right now, if you walk in that room, it's an empty room, but you see a whole bunch of conduits. The reason for that is when we do find the right system that will work for us, we want to bring on solar and be able to pump that in there and be able to put that back into the system. Um, but at the moment, we haven't been able to find something that would work well for us. I, like I said, I'm on TASB Energy Board. I, I'd be able to, I'm able to help um, districts and cities and hospitals across the state be able to procure electricity in large amounts. We have contracts that run out till uh, 2026, 28. So in doing that, the other thing too I'm watching is we, we, we are also buying power from solar farms across the state, but we've seen they, those get iced over and we cannot depend solely on that. We cannot depend solely on, on wind farms because they can ice up or they can have um, damage. And, we, and those are direct current too. You can't store that. It's gotta be able to produce it at the time when we need that as well. So there's gonna be some sort of balance to that. Um, we have no fans in this district. I know Irving does, but when I was talking with them and looking into being able to use fans and windmills, they said that the, the it didn't produce enough in our area. We don't have the, the amount of wind that we need to be able to make it, fit, you know, uh, uh, sustainable. So over there, they said it barely turned enough electricity just to put the signal onto the panel, the TV that it was that it displayed on. So I'm not saying it won't. That's what we're saying is we're trying to prepare for that. And these companies that I've, have come to me and talked to us, they said, so they'll run things past us. And they wanted us to jump on a 10 year contract. But that didn't make sense either, because if I jump in a 10 year contract and I asked everybody in the room, how old their cell phone was, average uh, cell phone age was two to three years at best, or actually at worst. Some of them were like nine months and one said he changes it over every 12 months. If that's the case and technology is changing that quick, quickly, then if I put these panels on, are they outdated? And they said, basically, yes. They were telling me that in 18 months to 28 months that we would be outdated. And I said, well, are you gonna replace my equipment so I can get more efficiency so I can be, instead of, losing the efficiency of having this large of a farm. And he said, no, it was gonna be on me to be able to do that. 
So we're looking for that. We're still watching it. I'm still trying to engage in different people to be able to have something like that. And then as we do our new facilities, we run extra conduits out to the islands for the same reason. So that later down the road, we could produce canopies over the parking lot and turn all the parking lots into basically solar farms. Um, and so that, that is one thing. The other is, are we using EVs? I usually get that question. We are not. Um, the ROI, the study has come out that on white fleet, um, and I have, a, I have a large white fleet, probably, um, I think we run around 150 to 880 vehicles. And a white fleet would essentially be anything from a, a Ford Focus uh, up to, we have one ton pickups and uh, some sprinter vans, things like that. There is options in all of those to be able to have electric vehicles in those. But for us, the ROI is there for maintenance and cost, but for the, I gotta be able to put electricity into those. And at the moment, we're not, I'm, I'm having people that are concerned about us bringing on that amount. And then buses would be another one. Um, if the bus, the battery on a bus would be so heavy and the amount of time and energy it's gonna take to charge that overnight to be ready for the next day, we, we need something that, is, that we can depend on for our students. And we're not able to be able to send them to San Angelo and then have to pick up electricity because the work's gonna work for a bus is not gonna work the same for your Tesla or for you know, a Ravani or something like that. So we have not got on board with that just yet. It's not that we're not looking into it because I told my boss I was gonna get a, a Tesla and about, I think everyone freaked out. And I was like, hey, the ROI is there and why would the executive director not drive something like that? Um, and so we, we talked about it. So we're still looking into it and trying to be prepared and ready to use that in the future. I feel it is gonna be here. It was something, I like the ROI on our maintenance for the vehicles. And with having 55 square miles, it makes sense that most of my trucks are gonna be within that, but our buses don't always do the same thing. So we're, we're keeping an eye on that piece and, be, and trying to be ready. Um, I think that is, outside of that, the only other piece too, and I don't know if this is uh, up you guys alley or not, but one thing I wanted to share is we are starting to look into, I talked about Rosie and uh, the, you know, Rosie and the, the Jetsons and uh, the uh, fifth element kind of analogy in the beginning. We're starting to utilize technology like that too. And, and efficiency in human resources is as important. And I feel in trying to provide well being for our staff as is many of these other things that we were talking about. And I, I read some of your charter and I felt this is why I wanted to bring this up as, as well. We're starting to utilize uh, autonomous equipment. I have two autonomous scrubbers in two of our buildings. Again, bullets before cannonballs. We were testing those out. We want to see how well that would work. <clears throat> the biggest issue we had is it scared a lot of our staff in the beginning. Of course, they thought it was going to take their job. But once we showed that they could, and they were also scared of the technology, they weren't sure that they could run that. So my custodians feeling that this was something so technolog te uh, technological, it was something that they were concerned that they would even be able to, and I've got some that may not be able to read. Um, and so they didn't think, oh, I can't do that. I'm gonna lose my job because you're gonna expect me to operate that. The difference was that, no, that wasn't the case. And they've now learned that that is, I'm bringing things like that in to augment, to help us. During COVID, we were down. So my staff was, we were about 60, at one point, 61% in vacant, um, I'm sorry, the other way. I had 61% of my staff, the rest of what I had in vacancy. We had lost that many um, staff. So we were still having to expect or expected to clean our buildings and do high level sanitization during that time. So that we, we had to lean on our uh, equipment and technology on that. We started using um, backpacks to and do electrostatic sanitization. Um, the autonomous scrubbers, they could drive them, program them, and let them do the cleaning and clean all the hallways. Um, we also use what in buildings, so for our environment to clean it, we use it on our HVAC, and it's called bipolar ionization. It sounds like magic, I, and, and I really, when the first time I read this, I thought they were just, you know, it was hocus pocus, but it actually was invented by Einstein. His sister, uh, uh, suffered from uh, TB or something over the lungs. But when she would go to Sweden, it lightened up and things worked better. He studied it and found out basically it's the concept of bipolar ionization. It is negatively charging the, the air molecules. It goes out, it collects them. They, everything, and it, at the time too, the company we were using was trying to get their COVID testing uh, lab approved. So they couldn't say that they were but as we found later, yes, the research came out and it could help kill that because it kills everything else. Uh, TB, it kills uh, MRSA, 
Everything else I'm usually fighting, um, Ebola, it kills all that in the environment. And so we actually have that attached onto our HVAC. And as we move forward, we'll be doing more of that as well. And to be, here's another one to save on time. I know this is probably isn't everybody's crazy thing, but I have an autonomous striper. We have a GPS head. We look at the field. <coughs> takes one guy to throw the thing on the ground, fill it full of five gallons of paint. He selects what field we want. Is it a rugby, uh, lacrosse, soccer, football? He hits go, has to fill it twice. One guy can do a field in 45 minutes now where it used to take to set it up. Uh, it used to take four guys two hours to, to make sure that it was nice and clean and straight. And so now I've just gained a lot of um, back in my personnel. So that is basically what I wanted to bring to you today. I hope that uh, that helps give you kind of some insight and uh, I'm more than willing to open up for questions. Well, I'm, this this is John. Um, when I I just wanted to say when I, when I met Josh, I um, we're having a bond issue out here in HEB, and um, not that I was uh, I'd learned from a friend of mine because I haven't really been you know involved in school in a long time because you know my daughter's you know forty years old and um, anyway. Um, I was like, why aren't they thinking about, you know, why aren't they thinking about geothermal, you know? And, you know, when, when I, you know, when I was talking to Josh on the phone, I was like, man, well, he's done his research because it didn't work, you know? And um, it, that's why I was so impressed with you, Josh, because you, you know, you, you'd already, I like your bullets and cannonball uh, you know, analogy. So, um, I just thought you're such a well-rounded person and having that kid uh, look with the, um, with the uh, LEDs, because I, again, I'm me, you know, I'm, I'm raising an eight year old and she's back, you know, now I'm back in school a little bit and, you know, she does have ADHD and the, the calming of the lights does make a huge difference. So I I'm very impressed. I'm also very impressed with you, Josh, because you're saving me money as a taxpayer. So anyway, uh, just just another thing that I was super impressed with, because uh, I, I don't, is Michael Martin here today? No, I don't think so. Okay. Well, the, the other thing I was super impressed with was the, he's already got everything set up to do solar right off the bat. and. Um, and also the analogy about the cell phone and maybe, well, I'm going to say we aren't quite there. I think efficiency wise, if you're going to make, you know, a 30 year investment on uh, a commercial or school building. So I, I like the idea that he's thinking way out into the future, thinking about the trees. Um, that was the other thing I wanted to talk to him about was, you know, the tree planting. Because, you know, I'm doing the tree playing with Rotary and Earth Axe and, you know, Trammel Crow. I just think that, um, you know, think about how we can use trees and cool this down. And like you talked about canopies, um, uh, it, that's something that we all need to think about. So anyway. Thank you, John. Pradeep has had his hand up. Uh, Pradeep, you have the floor. Hey Josh, uh, it's an excellent presentation. It's really close to my heart because I do research on all these things. I had solar panels for more than a decade. I did research on uh, putting uh, geothermal on my house. Again, it's at residential level, not at a commercial level. Uh, but one thing I wanted to talk about is the solar, like, you know, so the research you did in terms of investing in solar panels, the one thing you talked about is where to store that energy. Of course, batteries is one way to go. But I do like send it back to the grid because, you know, so most of uh, uh, the electricity providers these days, they will pay you at the same rate, you know, so where they, you know, so provide you the energy. Of course, it might be different for commercial purpose or large scale buildings, but still you can use the entire grid as a backup, uh, battery backup in that case. That might have some impact on the ROI. And second thing about like, you know, the technology going uh, at a rapid pace in solar, which is true, you know, so compared to 30, 40 years back, the solar is way ahead. But I had the same question uh, 10 years back when I was installing solar panels, one of the first in my neighborhood, 
everybody is talking about like you know so solar efficiency is going uh, uh, rapidly like you know so by five years or six years or ten years your panels will be outdated and you know so you'll not be producing enough but uh, there are like physical limitations on solar panels how efficient they can be we are at like you know so really at the cutting edge of how much efficient it can be it's a 35 percent or something uh with drastic changes it cannot go up but the reason i'm mentioning that is i mean you should have you have, might have already done the research uh year over year there won't be that much difference in terms of technology in terms of solar panels one thing that makes difference is solar panels last for about uh, 30 years or 40 years even uh that means you need to have a good uh, company to back up in case you know so there are any warranty issues or something in that regards it is beneficial to tie up with somebody who has long history but in terms of technology i don't think there is much of an uh, what call uh, impact on waiting longer that's what my you know so my understanding is i appreciate that uh what are the, there's some coming out of tesla right now that has really got my my interest peaked as well and you're and you're right what goes on residential and, and what does on commercial we do we have some limitations uh, i have to work also make through go through my contract as well it sounds strange but i've, so I've contracted out a certain x amount um and what's crazy is if i don't spend enough i actually get a penalty if i spend over that then i get another penalty so you're sitting here trying to set within a window and and i always use i didn't i didn't say today but typically i talk about the the hot dog balloon uh, if I squeeze on one end, so I start with a reduction, then I've got to think about what the transfer of that is somewhere else um, in our budget. I talked about how we what we're doing with HVAC, but the problem is my guys started freaking out in the HVAC because they used to buy a motor for $35 or $75. Well, now that motor is $350 because, and they're, they think, oh, we're spinning, we're just blowing things up. I'm trying to explain to them, like, it, we're seeing millions on savings here, and you're seeing hundreds of increase on a part. I said, I get it, but I need you to understand it's that balloon that I'm squeezing that we're trying to do that. So absolutely, um, I definitely want to keep an eye on the different you know, systems out there and companies and being able to bring somebody in here is, is that's eventually it's going to happen. We just got to be able to make sure we get all, all of it to work out. I appreciate that though. Thank you. Uh, Patricio has a question and then there's uh, Molly has an interesting question in chat. We'll get to her after Patricio. Go ahead. Patricia. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I have a question. I would like to know what do I, what you're doing in terms of batteries. And I'm sure maybe you are using rechargeable batteries, but also the regular batteries. That is the big issue in all institutions because, and especially, I mean, every home we use batteries, and I keep collecting batteries, and it's it's kind of challenging to find a real place to dispose these ones, and a lot of people just put them in the, in the trash, which is terrible. So, what are you doing in terms of that? Are you Thank about you. Disposing of the batteries, or what type of batteries we use? Yeah, both uh, disposable, dispose the batteries. I mean, because the rechargeables and the regular batteries are two different animals, right? So you have to dispose differently. So, what do you do? In, with those two types of battery. Okay, um, most of our batteries are, are not necessarily rechargeable. There's a little bit of a caveat to that. So on commercial, uh, like all of our fire panels, they have a kind of a battery that looks like you might see in a, a little tight vehicle or something like that. Um, and so those, they're actually being, they are being charged, trickle charged through this, the power of the, the building. Um, and so when those, when we're disposing that, we have a, a company that we send those out to. Um, the rest of the batteries, we really don't have a great deal of other ones. Um, uh, some We have some exit light signs, but we're trying to switch those over to where they're just direct feed and they're not on that. Um, I have emergency lighting. And, and so in that case too, we're also shifting off of batteries and the new buildings, there's a new uh, code requirement for um, for schools in Texas. And that is we have to have a storm shelter that will provide the uh, for the entire occupancy of the building plus a little extra, and you can exceed that by however many people you want. Um, in a lot of schools now, they are going to inverters and are using large batteries to be able to provide that backup. Um, the cost on that to me, what we decided was in our area, we ran into a number of situations. We decided to go ahead and jump over to generators and be able to put those in because I've lost power on buildings and had the generator that was there 
and the way we have picked up all of the office, all the emergency lights and the freezers, coolers to assure we don't lose food in doing so, the school never even knew they lost power because we have the LEDs that dim down. And so they never saw that. So we don't use batteries on that. Whereas some of the other districts are going to that. We've been told we're a little different than that. Northwest ISD is, is similar. They're using generators as well. Um, so I try to keep the batteries down to a minimum. That's something I wish we could find something where we could remine those batteries and get them you know, back into the new batteries instead of just disposing everything into, into our trash or into uh, the dump. Um, but we we have we send them to a company that's I'm hoping that's what is actually happening with those. Good, thank you. Um, so, thank you very I, much. can you can you see Molly's question, Josh? She's been working a lot with the Dallas ISD. She's probably in South Texas with low bandwidth. Uh, can you see her question in chat? Oh, Josh, you're muted. Okay, is it, you said Molly? Molly Rook, I can read it if you can't see it. Okay, I can see it now. Of course, you don't ever see the North Central Texas area. Yes, matter of fact, we I just had a collaboration meeting. Um, we have, we work with our city so closely that we come together and we were talking about um, a number of things through our North Texas central governments. Um, the, the programs on there the, for the pilot, we have had some come out. Um, but again, like I said, we're not ready to start bringing on those EVs just yet. But if we did, that would be a program. And that's one of them that we've looked at to be able to participate in. Good. Any final question for Josh? I've got five pages of notes and I did want to, one of the first things you mentioned was uh, you don't do greenwashing. And uh, that struck a chord with me because one of the four main initiatives for climate reality project going forward is to uh, really confront greenwashing. And it's, it's pretty rampant out there, a lot of organizations uh, are, are claiming to do quite a bit, but uh, what they're actually doing is different. Um, so that definitely struck a chord with me. The other thing, um, I just read a book called The End of Night, and you were talking about uh, lowering lights. And this particular book was talking about how overlit we are in general in society and classrooms, it just that there's some misconceptions about security. So that really struck a chord with me too about lowering the lights a little and, and that actually having some impact on, on behavior. Um, so that's about all I had. Any final question for Josh before we move on. We certainly appreciate, it was a wonderful talk with, uh, like I said, I've got I'm on my fifth page of notes and uh, a, a lot of rich content there. And thank you, John, for for uh, connecting with, with Josh. Any last question for, uh, we have something from Beth um, about maybe our other school systems as forward thinking and conscientious as you are? Um, I know I, there's, there's certain districts I work with obviously more than others. And I would say they're probably the ones who are, who are thinking that way. Um, what I'd like to see is a whole system do that versus, uh, like I said, going back to the conversation of you have that energy code conversation and they do things just to make it, uh, make themselves legal on that. What we wanna see is we wanna see people try to do, go exceed that as a whole, as across their entire district. Don't do just one, uh, one system at one school and then you don't do that at another. Um, I know there's a, a good five or six that, that are doing, like it's kind of a competition between us to see who can, you know, who can get the lowest square foot cost and things like that. Uh, we do have benchmarking across the state as well to try to help with uh, locate that and, and generate other ideas to be able to help the other districts. 
And that is one thing that's different about school districts is um, we're not like in the, in the case of businesses and you're competitive. The other day, yesterday, I turned my whole um, process manual over to a, a district south in South Texas because they were they're suffering and they were needing some help with their processes. We, we don't mind doing that. It's a little bit different than having a business in your, that you're competing against. So um, th there are some out there and there's some that are doing it because they have to. And there's some that yeah, I probably, maybe they just don't know any better. They're just doing what they're told. So I, don't, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Good, thank you. Well, uh, thanks. For, thanks. Rich, can I, 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 need, I, wanna, um, I wanna say one more thing about, about electric buses. Um, because you know, I worked at DART, Patricia has worked at DART. You know, the electric buses right now, they're so heavy, you know? Yeah, you'll get, you know, maintenance is a lot less, but the, the heaviness and the ability to charge them, are just, it, it's just not there yet, in my opinion. And I know everybody wants to go to electricity because they think diesels, you know, killing the kids, which, you know, it isn't a good thing because, you know, there is a lot of particulates, you, you know, however, you know, until the, the battery, like DART has a downtown, you know, circulator system and they have to have three, but just because they only have a 17 mile range. And if you're running a, a, a school route, you're going to have a, you know, 50 to 100 to 120 mile range and you need to be able to do that. How are you going to do that? You know, an electric uh, uh, bus. So anyway, that's my that's my negativity about electric buses. Great. Thank you, John. OK, well, um, Josh, you're certainly welcome to stay. We just have a couple of quick items and we'll be done. We greatly appreciate you and what you're doing. and spent coming to spend time with us today and uh, educating us about HEBISD. Thank you again. Um, we just okay. have one we just have one announcement today um, came in at the last minute. I will put the uh, agenda in chat again so you can see it. Uh, Roger, uh, reminded us about there's a book club meeting coming up on September 6, 7.30 p.m. Madeline Ostrander's At Home on an Unruly Planet. Uh, Bill McKibben calls it marvelous. Two thumbs up. Um, Roger's finding it powerfully evocative. And I put the Zoom link in. Uh, in the chat. Uh, that and uh, the only thing else, uh, Jeffrey, do you have something to uh, to wind us down a little here on this warm Saturday? I do. I have a short poem by Kai Seidenberg. It's called Two Amazons. The Amazon is burning. Trees, plants, animals, millions of living treasures consumed by the blaze. The lungs of the earth filled with smoke. The homes of countless creatures destroyed. Such massive devastation of intelligent life is too painful to watch. More than our hearts can bear. Meanwhile, a very different Amazon vies for our attention. Luring us with millions of products, one-click ordering, free two-day shipping, a convenient, compelling distraction as close as the nearest screen, usually closer than the nearest person. Selling the illusion of easy, painless consumption, the full price tag hidden behind a shiny curtain. Which of these two Amazons will receive our precious attention and money? Which one? will we keep alive as the earth burns? And yes, I did buy this book of poetry on Amazon. <laughs> Thank you, Jeffrey. I've been trying to use Barnes and Noble and, and Nook more, but sometimes it's challenging. Good, well, that's our meeting today.